Welcome. My name is Brian Williams, and it's a pleasure to have you join me today on today's webinar. What I'd like to do is just uh, make a couple of announcements at first. Please use the question and answer uh, function on Zoom to log any questions that you may have that you'd like for me to respond to. Hopefully, I will be able to address all of your questions and concerns. Welcome to today's webinar. Today, I'd just like to kind of facilitate a conversation about what colleges and universities can do to improve police community relations. My students are well aware of my approach to kind of sharing information, I always kind of provide a guiding quote. So today I'm pulling from Sir Robert Peel's, one of his principles that was published in 1829 that highlighted the nine principles for uh, effective policing, laid out a blueprint, if you will, for how we should design police departments. And this particular quote highlights that there should not be a distinction between the public and the police. I'd like to kind of share with you a little bit of information about who I am. Uh, this will provide you some insight in terms of what I do and why I do it. I'm an associate professor here within the Batten School. My background is in public administration and public management. I consider myself to be kind of a, a scholar activist a bit, so I engage in applied research that is primarily qualitative, that's based upon engagement. And this engagement allows me to appreciate the lived experiences of those folks I'm really passionate about understanding. And those folks are uh, police professionals within law enforcement organizations, as well as community members from diverse communities. And I've tried to get a sense of what does it mean to be. And all of this kind of flows into a project that I, I have called Getting to We. And in that project, it kind of focuses in on the first word of the preamble of our Constitution. We, the people, in order to form, form a more perfect union. So I'm really fascinated by the opportunity to get to this destination of power with and away from this power over kind of paradigm that seems to uh, focus uh, a lot of our attention on where we are right now in terms of our organizations. This slide kind of highlights the framework that I kind of operate from in terms of my teaching, in terms of my research, but also in terms of uh, my service as well. And it draws upon the Latin phrase that basically says you have to look back at the past in order to understand the present, in order to plan for the future. And this kind of shapes my approach to kind of understanding what's taking place uh, at the interplay or intersection of race, policing, and public governance. And I use a theoretical framework of co-creation and co-production that basically kind of allows one to kind of reimagine and redesign public policies, public programs, and related professional practices. And once again, I do all of this in the, within the context of policing. What you see in front of you is the focal question of interest for me. How can we be proactive in a coactive way instead of being reactive? And I kind of apply this in, within the context of policing, uh, particularly around police community relations, with an understanding that this environment is a very volatile one and it's associated with being a, a kind of a wicked problem environment where there aren't a lot of answers that people know to these complex questions. We don't really understand what might be taking place within this environment. But we do have some knowledge and we have knowledge of the historic, historic harms that have happened within these spaces. Within the US context, what has been lawful or legal has been awful, especially when we think about race and policing. And we think about the old slave patrols that were the precursors of what we now know as police departments. We think about the enforcement of unjust laws like segregation. So we're at this wicked place, uh, this wicked problem kind of environment, and I try to kind of work around that particular uh, space. I believe that we have to uh, engage in a process where we can I guess, uh, kind of engage in, in, in individual compassionate action. And what I lay before you is kind of like three steps or three phases of it. 
empathy, sympathy, and compassion. And this takes place at the individual level where I acknowledge the pain of someone else because I too feel their pain. And then ultimately, I agree to act upon the pain that we both share. But I try to extend this beyond the individual level to also to the collective level. Well, we begin to acknowledge the pain of the other. We begin to feel that the other's pain and we agree to act upon the pain that we now share. Thinking about where we are right now, there have been a lot of lost opportunities. We failed to adequately act and implement upon some recommendations from the past. And I lay before you three uh, major reports that were uh, put in place in response to problems taking place within the environment during those times. The Wickersham Commission Report, the Kerner Commission Report, and of course, the most recent Presidential Task Force Report on 21st Century Policing. All of those reports had similar themes. How do we improve policing? How do we lessen the harm that policing has done to populations within communities? Uh, and focused in on really uh, trying to increase the credentialing of police officers, but also being mindful of police issues around uh, excessive use of force and police brutality. But we failed to act upon and implement these recommendations. Because of that, we're now kind of dealing with uh, less than optimal returns on our, our investments. We've made some bad decisions. Those are the opportunity costs. With these opportunity costs, uh, we see a growing distrust by the public, uh, growing lack of confidence by the public in governmental institutions, including law enforcement organizations and the, uh, uh, those that make up the criminal justice system. So we see this, this civil unrest from a local to a global kind of scale that reflects the human mosaic. I have a couple of slides here that highlight uh, some data that kind of allows us to kind of appreciate the perceptions of police across racial and ethnic kind of lines. And what we see during these two points in time, uh, late May, May 21st through 27th, and May 28th through June 3rd, we see a decrease in view of police uh, being somewhat or very favorable. And that flows across all racial and ethnic kind of lines. Similarly, we see an increase in those views uh, who, who view the police unfavorably. And of course, we see that increase across all racial kind of lines as well, ethnic lines. So that puts us to where we are right now when we think about the current state of police community relations. We're in a kind of tenuous kind of situation. And I see us being at the intersection of past and present. And we're teetering a bit. Evolution or revolution, reform or riots, progress or more protests, or should we define and divest or deconstruct and reconstruct? The question is, where do we go from here? And what I have is um, if Millie would upload the poll, there are some questions I'd like for you guys to respond to, uh, and I'll give you a minute or two to respond to those questions. Please use the polling tab on Zoom. That will allow you to do so. And I need to mention that uh, this is an anonymous poll, so it will not be connected to your name.
We have about 10 seconds left, please. I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, Millie, if you wouldn't mind ending the poll. So we can kind of take a look at some of the results. And we see that uh, the vast majority, 83%, know what it means to defund the police. 78% support defunding local police departments. 93% support the idea of a national program where every police officer receives an annual psychological evaluation. 93%, uh, 100% support having a national police misconduct re registry. 87% oppose having local police force, uh, a, a federal one. See if I could look at the other the final questions. 31% uh, support the idea of police officers uh, being paid more. 39% required to have a college degree. 63% uh, support officers living within the jurisdictions where they uh, serve. And 94% uh, embrace this notion where police officers be more diverse and reflect the demographic makeup of the community that they serve. Okay, thank you for that. And let's see if I can move on to the next. So we're in this teetering spot. So where do we go from here? And this is the question that I try to kind of utilize uh, to kind of frame my comments in terms of colleges and universities. Uh, what can colleges and universities do? When we think about these institutions, they primarily exist to do three things, to teach, to serve, and to explore or inquire into the nature of things. So uh, what can colleges and universities do? They can kind of really kind of think about their teaching, rethink approaches to teaching. And what I try to do in my classes, uh, my co-creation course, but also my police community relations course is to rethink and redesign public safety, have students engage in that process. And what they tap into are voices from the past in order to better understand the present. We are fortunate at the University of Virginia to have access to the History Makers Digital Archive, which is the largest uh, digital archive uh, of, all, of all histories for African Americans. Thousands upon thousands of folks have been interviewed. Great videos, great audio quality, and everything's transcribed. So that's something we try to do within my class is to kind of allow my students to really appreciate how you can rethink and redesign public safety by appreciating uh, those voices of the past, but also tapping into uh, this living history right now, or as Manning Marable would describe as living black history, where we also listen to what's taking place right now and try to incorporate that. So that's the teaching component. In terms of service, it's all about engagement and action. Uh, I host listening and learning exchanges, and I'm grateful to the Batten School for supporting that effort. And what I do is bring together members from the, the community with law enforcement to kind of have a dialogue where we kind of communicate across our differences. And it's an opportunity for uh, uh, the police professionals to kind of share with uh, the public their policies and practices uh, in a very transparent way, but also to have these meaningful kind of discussions. So there are tremendous opportunities for engagement and action. And finally, research. And that's something where we have to kind of continue to focus in on even more, uh, trying to understand police practices, identifying what makes them effective, uh, what makes them efficient, what is having a positive impact. Uh, so we need to kind of uh, investigate at all phases during that process, the formative phase, the evaluative phase uh, as well. And also research related to this notion of representative bureaucracy which is a theory that basically makes the argument that if public organizations like police departments are made up uh, with individuals,
that reflect the demographic diversity uh, that they serve and have an environment and a culture uh, uh, that, that allows those uh, diverse representatives to, to act based upon their lived experiences and the lived experiences of their communities, then those outcomes, those public services would be better. So more research needs to take place in that. We need to think again, once again, how do we kind of tweak our teaching a bit and how do we take advantage of our service kind of opportunities? On yesterday, I was really fascinated to, to and, and encouraged to kind of hear the comments of Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, where I think now we see uh, the need for more research. And he kind of takes a look at this, where we are right now, from two different perspectives. His perspective, and he's growing, I think, to appreciate the perspective of his colleague, another senator from the state of South Carolina, Tim Scott. Two different experiences, two senators, but what's causing these experiences to be different is something that I'm hoping that we will continue to, to focus in on. And that leads to this question that I have. When we think about where we are right now, is it the apple, is it the barrel, or is it the tree? And that's an area that I think is ripe for research to continue for us to kind of think about, well, is it the individual officer? Or is it the police department or organization? Or is it the institution, all right, uh, that, that we find ourselves in? And I think it's the soul that influences the tree, the barrel, and the apple. So I think we need to kind of engage in research at that individual officer le level, the organizational level to kind of really appreciate what might be taking place within cultures and subcultures of law enforcement organizations. The tree kind of level, what are those systemic issues that are at play, but also the soil or societal kind of level. What are those issues within our society that contaminates uh, everything that's planted within uh, our society? But one thing I do know is that research coupled with public management should matter in kind of mitigating these efforts. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of effective public management. So here's a slide where I want you to kind of take a look at it. It's from the ABC News poll. It allows us to look back to look at now. And what we see, we see on my right, the isolated, uh, Figures from December 14, 2014, and to my left, uh, figures, my computer's acting up a little bit, um, I apologize, but from June 5th of 2020. And what, what we see on the right is that majority of whites in uh, 2014, 60%, thought the incidents in Ferguson in New York City were isolated compared with 75% of African Americans and 51% of Hispanics. Now, when we look at to the left, June 5th, 2020, we see a shift has occurred. The majority of whites, 70%, majority of blacks, 94%, majority of Hispanics, 75%, as well as the majority of Democrats, 92%, and Republicans, 55%, and independents, 71%, agree that what happened to Floyd exemplifies a, system, a systemic rift between law enforcement and Black communities in the country. Those figures uh, kind of really highlight that we're possibly the convergence of change, where police community, police community relations can be improved. And it's primarily, I think, that's driving this is public passion, right? So, but also we see some organizational kind of responses. And what's so uh, heartening to me is the National uh, Fraternal Order of Police statement uh, in really condemning the actions of the officers in Minneapolis that led to the death of George Floyd. But what's lacking, I think, is political will but it's starting to emerge when we think about the proposals that are being offered now by the Democrats and also by the Republicans. But to really bring this into fruition, to make this actually happen, I think we have to engage, continue to engage in this process of awareness, understanding, acknowledgement, and action. And this is a process where we become aware of these issues and that awareness allows us to better understand what's going on and ultimately acknowledge collectively 
uh, that there's a problem that leads to this collective individual action. So opportunity is still here, something I wanna kind of focus in on. And I lay before you the first two bullet points that morning comes at the midnight hour. It does, so it looks dark right now, but morning comes at the midnight hour, especially when we drop the you. So it's up to you and it's up to us to have this shared sense of responsibility, to be mindful, to be intentional, to be inclusive, in order to be impactful in kind of changing where we are right now in terms of police community relations. So the opportunity is still here. We have new, a new day with new opportunities to teach, to serve, to research, to engage with others. But this is hard work and it's hard work and it will take some time, but we do have these new opportunities, this new day. So together, I'm, I'm an optimist together, we can. I'd love for you guys, I'm not on social media, but if you would, maybe this could be a little hashtag moment, together we can. So let's consider taking Peel's path. I have before you um, uh, from Jeremiah 616, the weeping prophet, kind of going back to this whole notion of mourning with the you. We are at this crossroads and we can take a look. And what I encourage you to do is to think about is let's consider taking Peel's path where the public and the police are one. That I think is the good way and we should walk in it and I think if we do, we will improve where we are in terms of police community relations, especially this, this whole notion of this collective we. And I draw upon the words of wisdom from Dr. King. We're all in this together. We're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. Thank you so very much for uh, Joining me, I'm happy now to entertain some questions. Uh, I apologize for my technical difficulties. Those of you who are my students, you know I always have a problem with, with that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I will kind of respond to the questions as they are listed in the Q&A. Okay. I have a couple of questions that I'd like to respond to. This is an anonymous attendee who asks, what gives you hope in tackling this issue? How do you keep going? Uh, what gives me hope? I'm an optimist, um, but I'm also a realist. And what I mean by that, as a realist, I understand that we're human. And as humans, we have some good and we have some things that, that challenge us a bit. But in our humanity, we always have the opportunity to grow. And that growth comes from learning. And that learning, I think, is kind of really based upon engagement. So that gives me hope. If we're willing to, to engage in this hard work, as I described as hard work, uh, we can grow. We can learn from each other. And I think we can kind of, uh, together we can, we can kind of address the problems that we now face. I have another question. Uh, if our police are troubled and historically racist and historically racist institution, is it possible to reform the practice to the point of anti-racism and justice? Or is any improvement within the system simply furthering the overall racist goals of the system at large? Great question. Great question. And I will try my best to kind of respond to it. We're at a moment where um, really co-creation, co-designing is, is possible. It's realistic. I'm trying to kind of get more information from uh, Minneapolis in terms of the process that they're taking with their police department. Uh, they understand that there is a problem. It has been a problem for quite some time. The current chief actually sued the police department, so he's aware of it. But now they're willing, I think, to kind of discuss, to share their respective truths, and to kind of come up with a process to reimagine a police department that's much more just and equitable. Uh, so you're having more seats uh, assembled around the table and you're inviting more people into that discussion. And I think it will, will pay off. Will it happen overnight? Of course it will not. It took 401 years for us to get to this point right now. It will take generations for us to really kind of address it. 
what's hopeful to me is that I think the growing number of people are acknowledging that we're having a problem. And I think we're willing to kind of uh, uh, address that particular problem that we have. Uh, I had a question, would I be willing to share our responses to poll questions? Yes, and I think Millie will be able to allow us to do that. I have a question, is it true that we need more research? Hasn't the evidence that laid out already points out at the systemic issue rather than the apples? Um, I think we, more research is always good. It allows us to kind of appreciate the nuances that might be taking place. Um, we know there is a systemic issue, but we also know uh, that it impacts the organization in those apples. What we don't know, what might be the most effective kind of management strategies to address that systemic issue, right? Uh, to address the organizational culture and subcultures that, 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 that exist. Uh, one line of research that, I, that, will, uh, that I'm kind of interested in is this peer uh, intervention kind of training kind of model. What kind of impact will that have? There's also a, a kind of growing line of research on uh, uh, network science that, that's really fascinating, uh, that allows one to kind of appreciate the impact of kind of transferring someone who has some issues uh, into other units and how that kind of contaminates or spreads across a police department. Um, uh, so, so more research is needed to kind of really appreciate what might be taking place to kind of come up with more effective mitigation strategies. I have another question. Given the two different sets of policy proposals by Democrats and Republicans in Congress, what are your thoughts on the likelihood of compromise on police reform at the federal level? Uh, uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm really hopeful. I'm hoping, I'm hoping they, they'll be able to kind of communicate across the, the differences and to come up with something that, that's reflects um, uh, what we need right now. Uh, we are seeing the impact of, of what's taking place, but I don't think we really can fully assess that impact. Uh, for those of you who are kind of much more kind of quantitative in, in, in your approach and understanding, uh, just think about the loss of productivity uh, that's been a result of this. Think about uh, the tremendous overtime pay uh, that, uh, you know, local governments have to put, not just within the U.S., but across the globe. So uh, this is a, a, a defining moment. It will reveal what we value. Uh, and hopefully we will kind of uh, embrace this old but true statement. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth uh, a whole lot more than a pound of cure. And I think it will be much more beneficial if we kind of invest the needed resources uh, to kind of address this, and that in includes those political resources, to expand some, some political capital to kind of really address it. Uh, I have another question here. Um, some would argue that reforms have not worked in the past and we should move toward abolishing police organizations as we understand them now. What are your thoughts on the past successes and or failures or on reforms and should we still take the reform route? Um, I am one who believes in much more, let's deconstruct, but reconstruct. But we have to kind of do so in a systematic kind of process. We need to be intentional. Uh, we need to be mindful. Uh, we need to appreciate those historic harms and we need to be inclusive uh, in that process. But that will take time. Uh, I, I do uh, agree with that statement that uh, Perfect is the enemy of the good when we think about policies, but we have to find uh, some kind of solution uh, that will be effective. Uh, so I believe in deconstructing to reconstruct, uh, to reimagine and redesign police departments that really reflect where we are right now, not where we were uh, with these old slave patrol kind of, kind of vestiges that are in place. Um, so we think about maybe developing uh, and implementing uh, across the board these correspondent models. When we think about some of the issues that are taking place within our communities, uh, police officers in some areas are well, well trained. They have the resources, but in the vast majority of areas, they don't have those resources uh, available. So in terms of deconstructing to reconstruct, I believe uh, we need a, a significant investment in additional resources 
within whatever we want to call these, these kind of organizations, uh, maybe uh, community service organizations instead of a police department, where you have uh, embedded within these organizations those kind of guardians who are police officers, but also those social service professionals who can understand some of those issues at a much deeper level than what we now see as police officers. So that's a starting point. Um, let's see, uh, it says, I know you're an optimist, but given police departments collective violent resistance to change, are you at all concerned about the potential rise of paramilitaries made up of current and former police akin to Northern Ireland and pre-independence Algeria? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I am somewhat concerned. I'm not disheartened, though, as much. I am concerned uh, when we think about uh, the shift that's occurring, uh, where some feel as if uh, they aren't uh, included in this notion of we, the people. Uh, so they, they kind of do what they do, which is understandable. They kind of come up with ways to better uh, kind of protect themselves and their communities. I'm hoping that we will uh, take advantage of the moment that we have now to continue to extend that net to bring more people into these discussions and dialogues to kind of really improve uh, our lot right now. Uh, I would hate for uh, to have really good policing in one environment and terrible policing in another environment. Uh, hence, I'm, I'm much more uh, uh, in agreement with trying to establish something that we all can can kind of embrace, not have this separate uh, and unequal kind of systems or structures in terms of uh, uh, public safety and public order. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to see another question I have is, what is your hope for UVA PD? Um, I, I try to spend a lot of time uh, and I am appreciative of the efforts of the University of Virginia Police Department like all organizations, they grow, they evolve. And they grow and evolve primarily because it's an open system, a system where the public can influence their growth and development. That's why I believe that engagement is crucial to this. The more that we engage with whoever that other might be, uh, the more likely they will kind of understand where we're coming from, become aware of our issues and acknowledge our truth and that will allow for us to kind of really engage in some, some, some co-activity that could lead to a better and brighter future for all of us. And that's my hope with UVA PD. Since I've been here for the past two years, I've had nothing but uh, an open relationship with them. They've allowed my students to kind of come in and to learn. Uh, and they've kind of taken in consideration some of those lessons learned from the uh, kind of engaged kind of research projects my students have. Uh, same can be said about Albemarle County as well as the city of Charlottesville. Uh, I've been really, really fortunate to kind of find myself in a place where these organizations aren't resistant to, but I think that they're, they're really appreciating the opportunity to evolve, right? To evolve with our community. Uh, what are my recommendations for improving police training or raising minimum qualifications? Ideally, I would love to have police officers uh, to have some uh, credentialing beyond where they are right now. Ideally, I would love to have a college degree uh, as a baseline for every police officer across the US. Uh, in terms of training, ideally, I would love to see that scaled up tremendously. We have 18,000 police uh, kind of law enforcement organizations, maybe 13,000 or kind of municipal kind of police departments. Uh, the very, there's a very small minority who have the resources to really kind of address the issues that we face right now in terms of preparing, equipping, uh, uh, developing, recruiting, selecting those officers who need to be within their ranks to better provide services to the communities uh, uh, that they serve. But the overwhelming majority lack those resources. So we think about a kind of a comparative kind of way of looking at things. We think about Germany, we think about Finland, and we compare that to the US. Uh, before the officers there hit the streets, two to three years of, of training. Uh, in the US on average, probably uh, between 
20 to 22 weeks. Uh, and that's that, that, that difference is, is scary. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity for us to kind of set a standard, a baseline uh, that should reflect uh, what we value. Uh, because these officers, we've given them the authority to take a life in the line of their official duties. And with that, I think we need to kind of create a baseline that, that kind of really reflects, you know, what we value uh, in terms of uh, who they are as, as people, but also who they serve. Um, one thing I'm a big proponent of is uh, this kind of collaborative training model, which will allow uh, police officers to be embedded with community residents to kind of go through training at the same time. Uh, because I think that would be a way to kind of uh, get people to kind of appreciate things from multiple kind of perspectives. Uh, so there are some opportunities there that exist, uh, but these opportunities, of course, require resources. Hence why I said I think there needs to be a major investment of resources. How do we best uh, train these officers of today to really um, serve the communities that they serve, especially if they come from backgrounds that don't necessarily reflect the lived experiences of the, the community residents? Um, that's something that we have to do. Kind of related to that too is, uh, you know, that's why I asked the question about should officers live in the communities that they serve? But we think about here in Charlottesville, uh, it's difficult on a police officer's salary to live within uh, the city of Charlottesville. Thankfully, uh, we have police foundations within Albemarle County that kind of assist. The Charlottesville Police Foundation uh, provides a housing assistance grant for officers. And they do likewise in uh, Albemarle County. But we may be somewhat unique within this community. Uh, but those are some things we have to kind of think a little bit about. Um, another question. Uh, would I include a two-year community college degree in my minimum or the four-year? I'm thinking much more about a four-year. Um, the reason they can take a life and I think we need to kind of raise the bar in terms of qualifications for someone who can take a life. And I'm a big proponent in in-service training too at a significant level um, to kind of keep uh, our police professionals on the cutting edge of what they need to do to do their job. Let's take, for example, a medical doctor. Um, uh, I'm terrible in terms of surgery and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I know little, if anything, about surgery. But what if uh, physicians were still practicing based upon what they knew in 1900? No advances in surgical techniques, right? Uh, physicians have to constantly kind of stay up to speed with what's there. And I think the same thing needs to take place in terms of police uh, professionals too, uh, across the board. Uh, again, so we shouldn't have high quality training being received in one location and 50 miles away, terrible training. Uh, I think that will be somewhat problematic. Um, another question, how can we defund and reform the public safety system without getting rid or immensely lessening qualified immunity for officers? Given that the Supreme Court has already shown unwillingness to address the issue of qualified immunity at this time, is it possible plausible, excuse me, to see substantial change in this area. Qualified immunity, I think eventually we will see some change in that. I'm just not sure how long before seeing that. I know uh, the Democratic proposal, I think that's something that I think they're much more inclined to kind of let's, let's get rid of that shield. But I think the Republican proposal is one that wants that shield to be uh, maintained. Uh, if you go back, if I went back to my kind of convergence kind of diagram, also I think within law enforcement, they wanna see that shield maintained. But I think we need to have a conversation around that to lessen uh, that because I think um, it might help in terms of public trust and public confidence, but also uh, it allows for, I think, police uh, executives, police managers, probably do a, a better job of the, it kind of cleaning their own house from within. And that opens up a whole nother discussion too, when we think about uh, the power of police unions in kind of uh, shaping uh, what we see now. 
and maybe the lack of, of, of willingness on the part of those within local governments to make certain demands uh, of uh, uh, those within policing. Um, from what I've come to understand from some of my research, it, it is a, a trade off a bit. Uh, with less pay, officers get more protections, but that impacts managing those officers because uh, as a hypothetical, we can kind of look at uh, what took place in, in Minneapolis, where we have a field training officer who uh, had 18 uh, allegations of excessive use of for force or complaints, uh, but yet he was still within that organization. Uh, uh, and that's somewhat uh, kind of disheartening a bit, somewhat scary, but more research needs to kind of explore that a bit. I'm getting an alert that we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I will answer one more question if I can find one. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Go back another question about qualified immunity and whether the political will exist at this stage. I think I've answered that somewhat. Um, right now, I think that political will has not kind of kind of gotten to a level where it needs to be to really kind of affect some change. But I think more uh, passionate pressure from the public will uh, allow us to kind of uh, kind of have that discussion uh, that needs to kind of take place. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, you know, together we can kind of understand this. Together we can begin addressing this problem. Together we can improve police communi uh, community relations. Together we can uh, get to this notion of we, and together we can form a more perfect union. But this will be a process. Uh, and as I think we've all agreed, this process will be a long one. And uh, it will not be a hundred yard dash. It won't be a sprint. It will be a marathon. And before anyone can run a marathon, we have to begin to train to run that marathon. And we're at the initial stage right now of, of kind of training for the marathon, marathon of, of improving police community relations. Uh, uh, there are some problems, but there are also some prospects for uh, some effective change. I thank you all so very much for your uh, participation. Uh, in this process. Um, I am hopeful, I'm mindful, but I'm also in, intentional and, uh, and inclusive. And I would encourage you to be likewise, to, to keep the hope, uh, keep hope alive a bit. Uh, uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. Uh, morning does come at the midnight hour. And right now I see some, some rays of hope that are bursting uh, on our scenes. And uh, Hopefully they will light our path as we move forward, as we kind of bridge the gap that exists between uh, the police and our, our local communities. Thank you once again. Uh, please stay safe, be well, and uh, all the best to each of you and yours. And to my students out there, I look forward to the day we can kind of see each other again within the, uh, the Grand Hall of Garrett Hall. Be well. <laughs>